Good morning. So welcome to the Venture Capital and Investment Climate Session. In the previous session, uh, we talked about uh, financialization and inflation and all the other problems that came out of the box. And in that session, we also touched up on, upon the opportunity, the hope, innovation, and tech. Hopefully, with this panel, as a venture capitalist in Japan, we can focus on the opportunity and the growth that is coming from innovation and tech, and especially in globalization, US and Japan kind of expansion. We have three brilliant, distinguished panelists. So uh, I would like to start off by asking the kind of like the macro environment um, question and how that is uh, impacted the tech investment and the startups. So um, yeah, perhaps uh, uh, could you, Dave, could you start off with sure. setting the scene? Yeah, absolutely. So macro climate, what we're seeing, look, I, I think the obviously big thing that just happened the last few months is SVB. I mm -hmm. think the good thing about that is it seems relatively contained. You know, when you look at the financial crisis back in 2008, you know, that was, you know, over 300 banks collapsed here. We hit, you know, we had a, you know, we had a couple. We were at Morgan Stanley, we were obviously fortunate enough to actually contribute to the solution. We injected some capital uh, into First Republic. And so it seems like the, the wound has been cauterized from that perspective. I think our current house view relative to, let's say, the S&P 500 is basically flat by the end of this year. And the reasons why, you know, we, we think, you know, 19 times, uh, you know, PE on the S&P. And we think given the fact that costs are, you know, the price of costs are, are going higher than, than the top line, still going to be some earnings revisions on the downward side. On the, on the other hand, you know, there, there's some reasons to be optimistic, right? Um, when you look at the software world where I, I I, I work mostly in, you know, currently software multiples are, you know, call it like six times on a forward revenue basis relative to maybe like 15 times back in 2021. And so it seems like they're in a, in a reasonable shape, particularly when you look at a growth adjusted basis. Then you look at consumer. Yeah, there's a little bit more weakness, but it seems like consumer is still in relatively strong shape. You have unemployment stubbornly positive at three and a half percent. And then you look at the IT spending environment, you know, in 2008, when we had, uh, you know, go 2008, 2009, we had our IT spending forecast was 6% going into 2009. And post Lehman bankruptcy, it went from 6% to negative one. And then you obviously had some pretty inflated consumer balance sheets back then here. You know, we're kind of in, in the same place over the last couple of years. It was kind of 6%, 5.5% or 6 percent you know, going down to around 3%. So, and that's driven by a lot of the trends that I'm sure we're going to talk about here that are still fueling a lot of companies. You know, we just had our tech conference at Morgan Stanley in February. You know, a lot of positive, you know, optimism around digital transformation, a lot of the initiatives that I'm sure we're going to talk about. So, a lot of reasons to be cautiously optimistic mm -hmm. from a market perspective. So, so what does that mean from an IPO and M&A perspective? Like, you know, IPO market, still very quiet. We had 145 tech IPOs in 2021. We had two, two in 2022. And this year, we're pro probably still, count them on one hand, you know, possibly a few into Q4, uh, as we're seeing some green shoots, you know, bake-offs happening, things like that in the US IPO market. M&A, I think, continues to be reasonably strong. So at volumes are not going to be as high as we've seen, we saw in 2021. Uh, but, but given you know, low asset prices, financing is still, yes, it's a little bit more difficult, but still available. And the amount of capital that financial sponsors have raised uh, over the last five years, uh, we, we think you know, there has been a, you know, a fair, fair, fairly large amount of activity in mostly leverage buyouts in the, the public side. And so M&A remains relatively robust. So short, you know, net, net takeaway is, you know, yes, there's been some, some slowdown, but, you know, some, you know, some green shoots from an optimistic perspective and certainly nowhere near where we were in 2008. 
So I guess your short term is kind of cautious, but mid to long term, very optimistic. That, that's a nice so, way yeah. to put it. That's right. Yeah. So is there any implications on startups and like uh, tech companies on how they should think about growth or financing? Absolutely. Uh, yeah, you, you can okay, take sure. Step <laughs> first. Yeah. Uh, yes, uh, yeah, absolutely. I, I think what we're, I mean, it's just, we, we've just seen a massive trend that the, the big keeps getting bigger. I mean, it's, 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 it's unfortunate, but, you know, you have from an IT spending perspective, I, I, you know, we're starting to see that, you know, our own IT, you know, practitioners are focusing on suites versus best of breed. And then that basically places pressure mm -hmm. on that innovative startup. Mm -hmm. And then from a startup perspective, it just, you know, the companies that I work with are, are needing to raise financing sooner. Uh, we're seeing kind of down rounds finally in the last couple quarters, uh, down rounds being more uh, accepted mm -hmm. and, you know, looking for alternative structures to finance. Uh, if they don't want to take a straight down round, uh, we're looking at, we're looking for and, and working with companies on different structures uh, to maybe kind of push out mm -hmm the um you know the valuation discussion and and maybe add you know debts a little bit of debt to the balance sheet as well mm -hmm. so yeah it's 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 not a it's it's, it's a rough environment right now for a startup okay. thank you also you've been in the venture capital industry for a very long time and uh, how do you see the current climate is it like the usual normal kind of uh, adjustment or is it something big what's your take on it yeah, um, I, I wouldn't want to say we've, we've sort of been here before, but I mean, there, there was a period in Silicon Valley where uh, you didn't see an IPO for 10 years and you saw very, very limited uh, financing. It was so-called the, 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 the internet bubble when it burst. And I, I, I sometimes comment that you, you, you can tell where Silicon Valley is by the traffic. Um, you know, uh, you know, when the traffic is heavy, everything is booming. When the traffic is light, uh, everybody's gone home to to pit, to, to pit. What did they say? B to B, B to C, back to Boston, back to Cle back to Cleveland. Um, but uh, the the other thing is, uh, my my brother here, uh, uh, the New York investment bankers used to be a little bit like migratory birds. When the uh, when the valuations were high. All of a sudden, they flooded into Silicon Valley, and when the valuations disappeared, they went away, and then they came back. That's changed with the, um, I guess, the absorption of the local investment banks over the years. And you know, we're fortunate to have uh, superb institutions like Morgan Stanley, uh, you know, able to help small companies, uh, you know, get into the public markets, which is really where they belong. I do think the ARM uh, IPO in New York, uh, I, I raised a lot of money in London. I raised uh, $2.1 billion uh, mainly for later stage companies uh, initially in London um, and Scotland, as my wife would uh, remind me, um, and uh, then in Australia. And we had Westpac as a major shareholder for, for quite a long time. Um, and then uh, later we raised money in Japan, primarily through uh, a banker. Uh, our investment bank or merchant bank in London was Kleinwort Benson, which had an office in Tokyo and had been involved in some of the early uh, privatizations uh, of uh, Japanese industries when the markets were just starting to open up. And we raised a medical fund in Japan for U.S. investment. And we also raised another fund, which I, I'll only tell you about in, in, in private. But from the standpoint of Silicon Valley, I mean, uh, th there's nothing new here. I mean, there are periods of contraction. There are periods when valuations come down. The valuations have been extraordinarily high. Um, I'm, uh, I, I, ha I have this statement that I make uh, that uh, unicorns are non-existent mythical beasts. What, mm. I'm, what I'm interested in are revenues. So, uh, you know, we finance 30 semiconductor companies. The names you would recognize would be LSI Logic, Altera, Atmel, Cirrus, Linear, all of which became billion dollar revenue companies. So, one of the challenges, not only for Japan and for Silicon Valley, is to focus on revenues. Because if you have the revenues and the earnings, regardless of what the markets are like, eventually you'll get the valuation. Um, so I, I, I feel very strongly about this. And, uh, but um, I, I do think that um, 
the later stage market, which, which we very frankly pioneered, um, when I started out, uh, the venture capitalists didn't want to invest later stage because they'd been in the companies five or six years and they wanted to get out. Um, now, you know, we didn't have a venture capital background. I didn't have a venture capital background, but I had worked for Intel and Apple and uh, American Express and Singer and uh, uh, Atlantic Richfield, just a bunch of, uh, you know, Fortune 50 and large tech companies advising them on international finance and international business. Um, so I went to where people were willing to listen to the story behind a later stage company, which is, Here's a company with a management. Here's a company with customers. Here's a company with earnings. And by the way, here's a book. And uh, you know, um, what I didn't realize at the time is that London prides itself in being able to make a decision on almost anything in a week. So I trot management over to London, and I take them around to the uh, closed end investment trust and spend a day up in Scotland. And we'd come away with five to $10 million, and we'd close two weeks later. And the venture capitalists loved us because we didn't take up a lot, of, a lot of their company's time. And very frankly, the returns were extraordinary because these companies were going public six months to a year later. You take a company like Oracle. We were in Oracle for six months. We got out with four times our money. You know? And then, of course, the stock dropped after the IPO. So we looked really smart. But in fact, we were just lucky. Um, you know, companies like LSI Logic, uh, run by Wolf Corrigan, who previously uh, ran Fairchild, uh, our areas of specialization were semiconductors, uh, medical devices, and uh, telecommunications. So, you know, we financed Oracle. If any of you have ever, well, obviously you've seen doctors, you've been in hospitals, you know, the first thing they do is they snap, snap a little thing on your finger to measure blood gas, oxygen, and your heart rate. Well, we invented that. And uh, basically, a company called Nelcor, uh, you know, uh, you know, produced that technology, um, and Nelcor, Nelcor went public and did very well. Yeah. Okay. So Nelcor san so um, you're more into seed and early stage investment in the U.S., and you also look at the Japanese market. Uh, how how do you see the climate right now? Am I on? Okay. Hi. So, and, um, well, I've been talking to a lot of startup companies here because we tend to focus on the pre-seed and seed stage. Uh, there are a lot going on here. And then, you know, that valuation is came to though. But then it's just cascading down from that really late stage, mid-stage companies that are having a difficulty, you know, um, fundraising um, because their valuation was too high and they have to take that um, down round and stuff. But in terms of that appreciate and seed, they are going strong. And I think that still a lot of investment money coming into the area. Uh, when you look at that a really big view of the things that numbers coming out for the 2002, um, the investment in comparison to that previous year, 2001, that total market uh, investment dollars went down to 38%. So that the previous year was that six, $638 billion investment money going into the market. Uh, last year was four, $415 million, uh, 15 billion went into the market. And then when you look at the Silicon Valley, uh, the last quarter, it's less than $10 billion money into the funding, which is that, you know, first time since 2020, 2018. So we have this very feverish year, 2021, but now we normalized to went back to the stage where we had this Q2, 2020. So that Q3, 2020, when you see the rise of the fund, uh, investing in the startup company, and then now it's coming down like a very sharp. But then it's just becoming a little bit normalized, you know, when it comes to the investment dollars and stuff. Um, I I think that there are a lot of excitement coming with the chat GPT. Um, I feel that 
it's almost as if seeing that internet revolution coming in back in 30 years ago. And then there will be a lot of, lot of new companies and opportunity coming in, a lot of investment money going into there. So and I am very optimistic that investment money going into these companies that have survived this winter time mm. and then, then create the great technologies and then, then will come back in the market and then, then people start investing the money toward the end of 2023. Um, because it's going to take a while for to see that really good companies coming out based upon that the technology. And then also, I, my fund focus on the well-being tech. Um, because of the COVID three years that people come to realize that now it is very important to really pay attention to the health and the well-being. Um, you know, President Joe Biden mentioned even at this, um, you know, uh, national um, speech that uh, mental health of that America is that uh, pandemic of, of the pandemic. So it's really, really terrible situation. 40% of the American adults suffering from some sort of that depression these days. And then there's government start pouring the money into initiate a lot of projects and stuff. So I see that a lot of uh, money pouring into the sector as well. Like Naoko-san just mentioned, I think those companies that enjoyed the winter very well would come out very, very well. It is also our experience doing a VC in Japan that the greatest company comes out in a downturn. Yes. And you know when you invest in when there's a hype, it's not so great. Um, especially currently, we have a lot of disruptive technologies coming out. What are you all excited about and what's the next big thing? What's your investment thesis right now? Um, let's start off with Arthur. Yeah. yeah, I was telling somebody that uh, I'm a hardware guy. I mean, I, I've done a lot of semiconductor investments. Um, and uh, I think that, uh, you know, maintaining uh, the cutting edge uh, functionality and superiority in the uh, semiconductor business is critical. Um, I think we've moved in the U.S. away from building our own fabs, or at least we had. Mm -hmm. With, and I think the innovation that was coming out of people who didn't have to worry about manufacturing the stuff is fantastic. I mean, it was a very interesting shift in the business model. But at the end of the day, I mean, you, you really have to build it. The, the other thing that's exciting, you know, we're talking about artificial intelligence. Uh, we're talking about quantum computing. We're talking about quantum data. You've got to remember that all of the information has to move through pipes you know, to get, you know, to that computing and those data centers. And the transition that's taking place is from the, the speed of electrons to the speed of light. Mm -hmm. uh, photonics go at the speed of light. Um, the a silicon chip basically moves data at the speed of electrons. So there's a movement to new types of materials for silicon chips, like you know, indium phosphide which can tolerate lasers without reducing the speed because the interface is a bad one like it is on silicon. So I'm all about you know, photonics, silicon, um, and the ability to support artificial intelligence and CPT. And if you don't have hardware, you can't run software. So Naoko? So what I'm excited about is that um, aside from the well-being stuff, which I'm going to just mention later, but then uh, chat GPT becoming the intelligent agent for each one of us. So and then I can see that a lot of op apps that we use, like open tables and then, you know, um, booking.com and all that stuff, you make that decision, you know, once you go to there and then you have to pick the restaurant best restaurant for your wife, a best restaurant for your honey. And then you have to do the search. And then you pick, and oh, damn, you know, that all the table is gone, right? But then I feel like a chat GPT become that a personal intelligent agent. You just type it, well, can you find the best restaurant uh, on this field? And then in the San Francisco areas on this day for my anniversary, and then you know, the answer is there, here. You know, there is the table available, and then, then time is here, and then, then you can make the reservation just on the spot. 
because I think that um, if the open tables and the chat GPT, you know, kind of somehow integrate it, and then you can get the one spot, and then there will be an end-to-end -end integration from that search to the e-commerce on the one spot. I think that kind of service is going to happen, and I'm very, very excited about it because I hate spending so much time doing this logistic for my family trip and stuff. <laughs> and anyhow, so the well-being tech, um, I mentioned that a lot of money coming into there. I feel that there are like three, four areas that we are focusing on and are very, very interesting happening. One is that I'm, um, aging health. So we really want to perform best and then we can't stop that aging. We can stop that age, but we can stop the aging. So there is a, almost like an immortality as a service happening in this um, area. Uh, there is a lot of the, the cellular generative areas and then a lot of um, opportunity happening with the supplement, that are diverse, that are aging and all that stuff. Uh, Google's and enlarged um, tech companies start pouring into the money into that this well-being tech areas that I can see that are things that are happening. Also that um, I feel like preventive medicine, that preventive Medicare that is happening as well because of the AI before you become that um, um, become sick, people can tell. For example, I invested in a company with that phenol, which is that, um, mouthpiece, and then you can, they can clean the mouth in 10 seconds with the ultrasound. But what they do is that they put the mouthpiece into the sanitization station, then they can see that what's in the saliva, and then they can detect that some of the early symptoms of that dementia and stuff, because certain content increase when you know, you getting that kind of symptoms and stuff. So we kind of look into that area as well. And then also that um, the areas that remote patient monitoring, because of COVID, like all the hospitals are closed and, and then a lot of people can't really get to see your parents, your grandparents and stuff into the hospital. And then, then uh, many things um, happen and you really can't say goodbye or you know, care your patient, you know, your parents and stuff. So and there are some areas that are things happen coming from that are COVID. So. So Dave, uh, from the market perspective, is tech-driven equity story a premium or is it more of like a macro kind of demographic-driven story valued better in the market? Do you, do you have some perspectives on how the market would value higher or give premium to the uh, startups? Let me, let me just follow up on your question. Yeah. The, 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 the is, are, you, are you talking about Japan versus US or are you talking about just the technology? In, in general, yeah. In general, yeah. the question is, how can you earn a premium from your equity story? Would a tech-driven company be a better story in current kind of situation or like a demographic macro-driven kind of story be a better? Get a good banker. <laughs> <laughs> I, I mean, the, that, that, okay, that, that, that's a great question. I mean, I think it's, you know, where we've gotten some of the best valuations for companies, I mean, it comes down to, I think, one thing you mentioned, Arthur, which is obviously focus on revenues, but like to double down on that. I mean, it's where can you find a company that just has the the TAM, the competitive mode to basically compound revenue at scale. So, you know, and, and, and one that actually has a, a core product and then has the ability to, you know, to generate, you know, 10x uh, relative to cross sell and upsell, ServiceNow would be a great example. You know that what that was a company that came out. It did have a competitive moat. It had competitors and it had did one very specific thing well, and then ultimately, you know, we positioned that as it's not just a ITSM or you know a tool for your IT organization, but it was actually a universal platform for. Uh, you know, driving all of the workflows entire uh, across your company, whether it's IT or front office or back office. And so that then gave investors an understanding that, wow, this is a company that has, the, so basically compounding growth over time, you know, at scale, uh, competitive moat uh, management team and a lot of the different, we can, we can talk through kind of IPO requirements, but that, that would be that. Right. Um, 
uh, let me just piggyback on, on on what you said in terms of kind of exciting trends. You know, she, she mentioned kind of the personal digital assistant from a consumer perspective. I get excited about the personal digital assistant for the for the, for enterprise companies. And so you, for the last twenty years, you've had a a trend where it started, you know, back in the early two thousands with a, a set of monolithic enterprise applications, Oracle, you know, SAP, et cetera, and then you had enterprise. Um, you know, Web 2.0, Internet, and then SaaS basically come. And because of that trend, you had a tremendous fragmentation into mm. thousands of apps. Um, and and that was largely by, and, and, and customers, we were willing to basically system integrate across multiple apps to basically get your work done. Now, given your comments as it relates to AI for the consumer, I, I see the same thing. That's what gets me excited is perhaps this is the age where the app goes away over the next 10 years. And it's really about, you bring, you know, you bring RPA, you bring workflow automation. And so some of the, some, some of the companies I get most excited about the ones that can actually glue together a lot of the fun individual point functionalities of applications and basically allow an enterprise employee or a, a consumer of an enterprise business to just get their work done in the way that you mentioned, but for, for the enterprise. That, that's going to be very exciting. Also, did you have a comment? No, I was just remembering when you asked the question about valuation, how, how we used to think a little bit when we visited young companies, which might be relevant. We used to have what we called the real company test, mm -hmm. which is that when you walk in the door and you look around, does it look like a real company or does it not look like a real company? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's, you know it, it, are, there, are there a reasonable number of people? Uh, are they spending money wisely? I mean, if it's a small company that's not making money, have they spent too much money on furniture? Have they spent too much money on this and that? We also had what we called the waterfall test, which is never finance a company with a waterfall in the lobby. <laughs> 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 but we just never did it. And uh, I think we missed a couple, uh, dodged a couple bullets on that one. Yeah, so I, I guess, you know, rather than the fake growth, the quality of the growth is important these days. Yeah. So um, let me touch upon another opportunity, which is globalization. And especially G1 Silicon Valley, we want to kind of leverage on the US and Japan kind of uh, uh, you know, relationship. So um, how, how should startups tackle or tech companies tackle uh, globalization and uh, what's key to it? Uh, also, please. Oh, right. Um, well, uh, I, I was thinking about um, the lack of globalization and connection between Japan and the U.S., that uh, the Pacific's a big ocean and the languages are different and people around here learn French and they learn Spanish and maybe a little Mandarin, but they tend not to study Japanese, tends not to be offered in the schools. Um, there's no question that there's tremendous talent in Japan and technology and innovation, and I actually think it's quite an entrepreneurial society, which is why uh, organizations like yours are are around. But again, if you're going to build a billion dollar revenue company, you've got to come to the US market. Now, the good news is it's a wide open market. We don't discriminate against anybody. You know, if you've got product, you know, people are willing to listen to you. Um, and the question is, how, how do you how do you cross that, you know, Taiheyo, I think it is that, that large body of water. And I'm becoming convinced um, that um, some of these premature public offerings in, in Japan, for example, are counterproductive. The reason they're there is you don't have later stage financing like the kind that we provided in the US. The question is whether the US venture capitalists are prepared to invest in Japanese companies. And you know, I, I'm happy to talk about how I think you know, it's possible to make that happen, but um, you know, a, you got to speak English, and you know, B, you know, you've got to get into these, you know, premium venture capital companies like Sequoia, like NEA, like Kleiner Perkins, you know, with a technology story and a U.S. marketing story that's compelling. Dave, I'm going to play off one thing you mentioned um, around the idea of we don't discriminate against anybody, and I, I in terms of globalization, I, I actually see. Just in the last couple of years, certainly one trend, just given the geopolitics, mm -hmm. that you know, the last thirty years, it's always been economics 
trumps politics. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, from a perspective of, hey, let's let me outsource my manufacturing to China mm -hmm. because it's cheaper or India. Mm -hmm. You know, it was always about the economics in. But certainly in the last year and a half, things have changed. And, and so now geopolitics is becoming a lot more important. You know, you know, Arthur, you, you had mentioned, you know, semiconductor manufacturing. We've already we've outsourced mm -hmm. all of that. Well, actually, just in the last you know year, that's actually coming back on shore. You, you, you see, you know, the U.S. Um, you know, I think investing something like three hundred billion to basically bring semiconductor man manufacturing back mm -hmm. to the U.S. And what does that take? That takes a partnership between the private sector, obviously Intel, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But in order to do that, they actually you know ask the government to put in certain export controls to basically enhance our competitive advantage against China. So I would say kind of there seems to be like a new frontier mm -hmm. relative to globalization in terms of if you're looking at a startup company, if you're a venture capitalist and, and looking to compete on the global stage, this is kind of this new trend that we haven't seen before mm -hmm. where you do need mm -hmm. to actually look at the public, private and government partnership mm -hmm. uh, wherever you go. Because before it was like, hey, you, you start a company, you take a public, and maybe like seven years later, you have a small lobbying organization, government affairs group uh, that works with the government. Uh, I think now you have to bring that in from the beginning. Can I, can I just add one thing? I'd like to pick up on something that Jesper said, which is that the Inflation Reduction Act combined with the Semiconductor Act are a massive stimulus and will create massive growth in the United mm. States. Mm. And uh, to respond to another of his concerns, um, I think Biden will be reelected by a landslide because of his economic success. And as for Mr. Trump's future, I don't think it's in the White House, although it may be in another building. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and to add to that, Japan has actually benefited from the same context too. Um, you know, uh, Japan has been onshoring uh, own domestic uh, semiconductor companies and also Taiwanese companies factories being built in Japan. So I think one angle where you can uh, identify new opportunities, the geopolitics, which, you know, never happened before in the globalization kind of era. So Naoko-san, you are kind of right on into kind of finding <laughs> opportunities across Japan and the US. Where, where do you see big opportunities? Thank you. Um, so before I became an investor, making an investment and stuff, I used to work for that large IT companies like Microsoft and Yahoo, uh, always in charge of that cross-border business between US and Japan, these um, relationship management and stuff, and it's not that easy. <laughs> and I think um, you know Suzuki-san and, and Shintaro-san experienced that it's just then um, coming from Japan to the U.S. is not very very easy thing because it's it's all about people. So when when you have that a great service and technology, but then you don't know as a management team how to manage the people in here, the diverse people with a different interest, with a different expectation is very, 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 very difficult. So and if you start a company and then, then you want to go global uh, from Japan, from the get-go, uh, I would recommend to assemble the diverse team so that you kind of create this um, um, opportunity for yourself to learn how to manage these people, diverse people, and then, then you can go to the next level with all these people looking at the same North Star. I think that's very, very important. Also, um, um, both Arthur and then they, they, um, they've mentioned that it is very important to get that funding from that notable VC from that US as well, because they are very well networked, very well oiled, in terms of that not VC these days, it's not just that a finance, but they have all the resources on that are human resources, marketing. You know, now they become this almost like a talent company that they have network of that are talented people to insert them into that um, start portfolio companies they funded. So and leverage them. So when that Japanese company start up coming into the US and then without much experience managing a diverse team of 
you know, uh, members, then I would highly recommend to really somehow get that funding uh, from that, that really good VCs and then, then help them expand your footage in the US market. Uh, my colleague uh, here is smiling. It's because he's had so much experience with VCs. And although <laughs> what they tell you is that they'll do everything that, they, that you said, the reality of it is you'll only get some of it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so as That's their marketing. Yeah. Naoko-san touched on it a little bit. We already have some successful Japanese entrepreneur, very successful in the US. Let me ask them for some them to share their experience and opportunities of coming into the US and maybe the challenges they face. Very briefly, uh, Ken Sam, could you get, share your um, experience, the challenges and the opportunity you faced in the US? <clears throat> yeah, so uh, basically, so I, <coughs> so, um, I started so, uh, my company so 11 years ago. And we entered the U.S. market so nine years ago. And when so uh, the revenue was zero, and uh, that we have only we had only so eight employees. And but so Horizon and the Globe is so invested in us, and the managing the so presentation so Horizon so suggested that okay you should go to the U.S. market first, and then Japan market second. So that so encouraged us to enter the US market so when so we we had so zero revenue. But so actuality, so there was so tough situation a lot. But so but so in the US, uh, we didn't have um, enough experience to manage the people, as Nong San said, and especially for the managing the executives, how to attract them. But I thought that uh, I think uh, the the possibility and opportunity for here to attract this great talent is amazing because of people are so mission driven. Of course, we need to pay a lot. <laughs> but at the same time, so if we have a great mission and a great vision, they want to so, uh, so enter the great company. And then so we actually so successfully attract those people and hire those people. But actuality is so uh, there's a uh, different so uh, the regulation uh, of the stock option in Japan, and then uh, we need to make the adjustment of the stock option issues, and uh, we are talking to the the gov Japanese government to adjust this issue, uh, adapt to the more like uh, so U.S. style, and this is critical, uh, especially for so how to so uh, make the secondary market in Japan, and because so as you know, and in the U.S. so it takes a lot of time to go public. And then in Japan, as you know, the Tokyo Stock Exchange is very easy to so go to the market. And then, so there is no such kind of secondary market, especially for the, the employees. Mm. And then, so we need to adjust the ecosystem. Uh, and uh, there's so a lot of issues in terms of the ecosystem. And uh, not only the employees issue, and the investor mindset in Japan. And so Globis and so Horizon is very, very rare. <laughs> And unique, as you know, but most of the investors in Japan don't understand the ecosystem in in the U.S. And then the the mindset of the the U.S. employees and uh, U.S. so the talents and the so investors are amazing. There is no discrimination, but the, on the other hand, in the in the Japan, there is a discrimination. <laughs> that so, the companies so, who want to so expand the business to global cannot be successful. They I think maybe Japanese people need to be more confident mm -hmm. to be successful in the U.S. That's something like a Sony and Honda. I want to get the passionate comment on that. But before that, I want to get another comment from Yo, who started up his business here in the U.S. and sold it out to Honda in Japan. About the opportunities, yeah, opportunities and, and challenges. challenges? You, yeah. Well, like in terms of opportunity, everybody's talking about it, and like same, like very entrepreneur friendly in Silicon Valley and all that. So it's like you know, opportunities like. No question about it, right? Like the, the, the kind of people we can hire here and all that is radically different. In, in Japan, it's very hard to build a management team that's, that's scalable internationally just because of the language issues and the experience in the, in the deep, you know, different sectors and different functions. Like it's easy to find the right kind of people uh, because the, 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 the pool of people with in individual sectors and different functions are like so 
abundant here. So it's, it's easy to build a, a great team here. So for, for me, um, when I build a team, I build a management team here. And, uh, but I built the engineering team in Japan because I was working on the automotive and mobile technology where there are a bunch of good mobile engineers in Japan and the good automotive engineers in, in Japan as well, in Tokyo as well, right? So, but here, great you know, automotive engineers in Detroit and you know, great software engineers in, in, the, in the Valley is a kind of difficult combination. You, you just don't go across the country to have both skills. So like, well, I saw the opportunity here and uh, being Japanese, I can hire a uh, good Japanese engineering team in Japan and build the uh, you know, American management team here. So there are a lot of opportunities here that you can leverage. It's just that, you know, you just, like I, I was raised in Japan, I was growing up in Japan, and uh, I didn't speak English when I came here in the US, like when I was, after I was 30. But who give a shit about what you cannot do, right? Like, like you know, as Your an English is excellent. <laughs> Uh, 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 thank you. As an entrepreneur, you just leverage every everything you have. Mm -hmm. Like don't, you know, like you just, you just use whatever you have. And you being Japanese is one of the weapons. And like then then you can differentiate from others. And you know, like not really a VCs and entrepreneurs really discriminate you. Like they don't ask me if I am from Japan or not. They ask me like what I can do, right? right? Mm -hmm. So you know, like I think there are a lot of. We just need more challenges, mm -hmm. more challengers here in, uh, from Japan. And uh, you know, it's, nothing is dif different, I, I guess. The opportunity is bigger here. Dave, you want to make a comment? Yeah. I, yeah, I would say great, amazing stories. I would say two things for me. It's I, I've done a number of IPOs in other, on, on other stock exchanges. And one of the issues that, like for example, take the London Stock Exchange, you know, you, a lot of a lot of times, it's hard for these jurisdictions to actually pay from a governance perspective. The board really matters, and so. But in order to attract the best, you've got to pay up for the best board members, and because that that's one of the factors that can really help you level the playing field with, you know, a, a U.S. company that you know was was you know born here, and you know they have an advantage. And so, but a lot of times, what I've seen is. You know, companies can't actually attract, or they don't, they're not willing to pay the stock-based compens the stock compensation that a U.S. listed company is going to be paying for the best board members. And one one or two board members can be, you know, you know, can magnify your ability to you know get into the network and and, and provide a lot of support. So that that would be number one is don't don't be cheap from that perspective. And then number two is uh, because of Perhaps what you're what you're mentioning, you know, you 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 know, invest in you. You should always be selling from an investor perspective, uh, from Series A, B, C, all the way to the IPO. And you know, when we do IPOs, we typically, you know, you'll t typically have like 15, 20 investors that invest uh, and own, uh, you know, most of your publicly, you know, traded stock. And of those, you know, we typically before the IPO, as, as Dan knows, you know. You want to have already built a relationship with 60, 70 percent of them before you even do the roadshow. And so to do that, you're doing non-deal roadshows, you're doing conferences, and you're constantly getting out there to build a relationship. Because of the language issue here, I think you got to do 2x. And so, and particularly in the current funding climate, uh, just don't, you know, because a lot of times I meet investors, and hell, you know, might meet companies like, you know what, I just did my Series C. I'm done, and they can, they focus back on the business. I would say, you know, always reserve you know five ten percent of your capacity, particularly in today's climate, to kind of always be selling from an investor perspective. Yeah, I mean, uh, you pay peanuts, you get monkeys. <laughs> I, I mean, I, I think it's critically important. I always say that generosity is a form of self interest. You know that if you take care of your people, if you take care of your directors and so forth, there is a there is a barrier that Japanese companies, Japanese startups in particular, should keep. Um, and it's really the only one I can I can think of, and that is that a lot of venture capitalists will tell their American companies not to talk to large corporations because they take so much time to make a decision, and they don't want their managements distracted by negotiations that may never go anywhere and may consume a lot of the management's time. 
So I think it's very important, you know, when you are talking to investors, because that stereotype is out there, to have a, a decisiveness to what you're planning to do and, and a time frame that, that suggests and exhibits a sense of urgency. I think the sense of urgency is absolutely critical. I mean, uh, you know, there's a world to win, so let's get on with it. Okay, so let's uh, open up to Q&A. Um, I'll take three questions each, and please uh, de designate who you want to ask the question to. Polisan and uh, Alan? Maybe ask questions to Dave or Arthur. Uh, we all know that venture capital community has virtually killed Silicon Valley Bank by asking popular companies, startup companies to withdraw money. Is it, was it the right thing to do for venture capital community? And if not, what the venture capital community should have done? To with, you mean withdrawing money from Silicon yeah, Valley like Bank? asking popular companies to withdraw money and virtually kill Silicon Valley Bank. But you know, I think- Let's, let's get should. another question and then. Well, well, my own- Sorry, let's get another question. Yes, yeah. yeah. Okay. Um, my question is also for Arthur. And your comments reflect an enormous pool of wisdom and experience, having been investing in the Valley since the early 80s, uh, investing in Oracle a couple of months before I joined the company back in 86. Um, Thank you for your contribution. <laughs> yeah. Well, I took them to Japan. Um, and my question uh, with, uh, I've been tracked in venture capital in Japan now for about 20 years. And I've always observed that, that Japan does the same as Silicon Valley about 20 years later. We just crossed the $8 billion investment mark last year, which was 1996 in the US. 1995 was the best vintage we ever had. Uh, Oracle, Microsoft, Genetic all went public on less than $30 million, which is the typical size of a good IPO in Japan. Reflecting back on your career, uh, what is the biggest mistake Silicon Valley has made as, he, as an ecosystem that has evolved over the last 20 years that we should avoid in Japan as we cross that $8 billion line? And what is the best thing you've learned in the last 30 years that we should adopt? So the worst thing to avoid, the best thing to adopt. Right. To so to hit your question first, um, the definition of a depositor is someone who can ask for their money back. Mm -hmm. I feel that the Silicon Valley model, and I, I, I've told this to my own companies, the idea that I'm going to give you some options that may be valuable sometime, and, and I promise to lend you 10 or 15 million bucks before you have earnings or anything material, and it's a real commitment. I mean, I think that was absolutely crazy, or von Zinnig, as uh, Jesper would say. And, um, uh, you know, I mean, yes, it was mismanaged. Uh, yes, the regulators didn't do their job. I think there is a place for debt in Silicon Valley. I, I pioneered the use of debt instruments many years ago. We liked it because we were first in line. The venture capitalists didn't like us because we moved ahead of them in the capital structure with a debt instrument, and we felt we could liquidate the debt instrument or the, the intellectual property to service the debt instrument if necessary. So this was going to happen one way or another. Uh, you know, banks lend, you know, banks invest long and, and take deposits on a short basis, and that has to be very actively managed, and it wasn't in the case of Silicon Valley Bank. So uh, best things I ever did and worst things I ever did. Well, one of the best was clear. Huh? Well, investing in Oracle was certainly a good thing. Uh, so, um, well, I can just tell you a little bit about the changes that have occurred. I mean, we always used to say that there are three rules to venture capital investment or three things that are important, management, management, management. But today, the three rules are different. They're total addressable market, total addressable market, and total addressable market. <laughs> Which means that if you have a bad management, um, you can change the management. Um, if you have a, a, a market focus that is incorrect, you can pivot. Um, but if you don't have a total addressable market to work with, there's nothing you can do except find a total addressable market. Uh, so that's, that's one of the major changes. Um, you have to be able to ride out the cycles. You know, you know, the an IPO goes away for. I mean, the bankers when the IPO market closes get out the M and A model. So companies have got to be sufficiently financed, and this is a, this is an area where Japan 
if you read, for example, uh, Leo Lewis, who's a commentator on Japan for the Financial Times, probably one of the most talented political and economic commentators on Japan in the world, what he would say is that the problem with the Japanese um, ecosystem is the lack of later stage financing. Uh, the companies are forced to go public prematurely. That's exactly the problem that we were addressing in Silicon Valley 20, 25 years before. So you want investors who are giving you 25% of what they eventually intend to invest in the company over the life of the company and who are going to stick with you. Um, some people say money is important, but money is very important. You know, if you don't have money, you can't think about a lot of other things. So adequately, I mean, it's something I'm going through right now with a company in the, uh, in the photonic semiconductor space. You know, they're, they're raising money and nobody wants to invest in hardware and we finally got the group together and it looks like it's gonna happen. And what I said is, we need to massively overcapitalize this company. You know, this is a hardware company. You know, you know we have a half a billion dollars worth of orders sitting out there. You know, they want the product. You know, you know we've got fabs that can produce the product but we should never again be in a position where we have to worry about raising money. We should be way out in front of you know, the money requirement. So for example, um, one definition of a successful C CEO is someone who doesn't run out of money. So don't run out of money. And coming to the banker again, when you're, asked, when you're offered more money than you think you need, the first rule of venture capital is take the money. I had someone say to me once, Arthur, you know, we didn't use a penny of the 30 or 40 million, or the you know, 10, 15 million dollars that we raised from you going into the public offering. And it was the smartest decision we ever made because we could have withdrawn from the public offering if we didn't get the pricing that we wanted. So, you know, that's also just another point of view. Take the money. Maybe you want to take the uh, Silicon Valley Bank question? I was going to take, I, I oh, love your okay. question, I, actually. Yeah. I don't, I don't so so I, the, my answer would be, yes, it's the, it's the tremendous ecosystem that I've seen between the early stage investors and the growth equity investors here in the U.S. that really enabled companies to excel and propel. So that, that's, that would be the thing to do. The, the thing that I guess I've seen didn't work was over subspecialization in the VC model and particularly investing in situations where, for example, a industry is on welfare. Um, like, you know, I, I spent like five, six or seven years in the alternative energy and clean tech space that uh, was uh, very difficult over the last 10 years. So that, that would be, that, that was a great question. Yeah, it's a very, very tight ecosystem mm -hmm. where all the women shake the same and feel all the time. Right. Yeah, and then on your on your question, I, I I think I think Arthur covered it. I I would just say I love my regulators, and I think they there's a meaning and a purpose for what they do, and they've kept us, you know, out of trouble for the for the most part. And I and I think that you know other banks unfortunately, you know, had had to you know had had some issues, and 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 I think. Optimum regulation is healthy for the financial industry. Yes, absolutely. Yeah. I, I would disagree yeah. just a little bit on this. I, I would say that your quality board and your quality of management mm. kept you out of trouble. And it's nice to have the regulators there just mm. to clarify what they want to happen. Thank you. Yeah. So we only have five minutes left. So let's go for two quick questions and two quick answers. Questions? Yes, please. I um, have a question to author about se semiconductor chip sack, like a 50 billion government funding. And, uh, uh, you know, the manufacturing back to the U.S., uh, how feasible is it? And uh, would that really, you know, uh, lead to create, the, you know, a semi-manufacturing industry back to the United States? Well, in, in America, anything is possible, firstly. <laughs> but, I, but I will say that, that, and, and, I, and I would refer anybody who's interested in this to a book called Chip Wars, which really traces the history of the semiconductor industry, which I was fortunate to, to be able to, to live through and, 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 and know a lot of the people. 
Um, I think the short answer is yes, but I'm not convinced that the successful parties will be the same as before. So for example, as I mentioned, and I want to be careful not to flunk the Shinyo test on this, um, but um, I advised uh, Intel early in my career uh, on the Treasury side for, for many years. And at that time, six years actually, at that time, um, it was really a manufacturing-driven company. And, and uh, that drove the whole company. The company's culture shifted fundamentally when uh, a chief financial officer became chief executive. And all of a sudden, it became a finance company rather than a manufacturing company. And that was the source of all of the, the problems. Whether Intel can become a manufacturing company again is a very complex question. Obviously, they're claiming that they're the only game in town and they should get all the money. I think we have to look at whether or not they're being successful with their strategies before we give them all the money. And I suspect, as is always the case in America, that we'll be surprised by who is successful and who leads the manufa manufacturing uh, renaissance. But I think the one thing you can be sure about is that there will be a man manufacturing renaissance. And even in Beijing, I think they're now talking about America rising. Thank you. Thank you for the excellent panel. Um, I, I've been here uh, in, in Silicon Valley through three bubbles, and we, we, we talk about how um, startups are, are usually born in these down times. Mm. I wonder how we look at the VC community um, in these next decade um, with a few hundred billion of, of uh, potential valuations flushing through the system. Will we see incumbent VC, uh, VC funds or a new generation of funds? For anyone, pop fly for anyone on the panel. Yeah, there are too, too many VCs now, very frankly. There's been a wall of money coming into Silicon Valley. Uh, that's what's pushed some of the prices up. Um, but you know, I mean, uh, my son just got a company financed in Silicon Valley at a, what I think is too low a valuation, but they got the money and they took the money, and you know, I think it's going to be a, a very, very big success. I think the other thing to remember, and I say this as someone who spent his career in Silicon Valley and thinks Silicon Valley is the center of the known universe, uh, um, and clearly things happen here that don't happen elsewhere, and, and we're a model. But there are other centers that are developing as well. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I think Jesper is a great booster for Japan and Tokyo, and I think he must be right. I think Japan has great potential, but I think the, the, the financing structure, you know, as Leo Lewis describes it, is, is still not quite right. I think there's a lot of great early stage stuff, but you don't have that relationship which stays with a company throughout its life, except perhaps with your organization. I haven't seen it. I think you're going to have to get the later stage money in the US, at least for the short term, you know, until it becomes, becomes more available. Um, but um, you know, I, I, I think that uh, there's great promise. Um, I think there's too much money, but companies are getting financed. Um, and I think the future is bright. Um. Yeah, I, I can still smell that a lot of money floating <laughs> in the Silicon Valley. Um, people, um, my VC friends are all kind of observatory mode that I'm waiting to see that how low the valuation is going to be. And then which companies are going to survive with the greatest technologies. And then also that uh, grit that when they can survive this kind of nuclear winter time. But then... Um, Money is still there. So and once they, there is a good opportunities coming up with that, um, you know, AIs and generative AI, especially, um, I think that, uh, you know, if there are right companies and stuff, then people will invest. And then that has been the same way. And um, it's been, it's going to be the same way, I feel. And then um, um, still a lot of innovations happening. I think that with the generative AI, you know, people, that who got laid off from the like, Googles and the Facebook, uh, Salesforce, and all these people that are my friends, all excited that are now finally that they can 
you know, go out and build their own service that they want because everything is available right on the fingertip that they can build a startup company and they can do the fundraising and stuff. So and uh, there's very exciting time. So I guess maybe it's a little bit cautious in the short term, but bright future in the mid to long term. Thank you very much for the great panel. Thank you, Elsa. Thank you, Naoko. Thank you, Dave. Thank you very much.